So hi, so we're going to jump into Job. Well, we're not jumping into Job. We're going through Job. Now, Job is known basically as the suffering um, book, the suffering person, the suffering experience. But I think we're, we're going to draw some different parallels from it. Um, number one, there's joys in Job, and we're going to find them. Uh, not that they're hiding, but a lot of times you come into something with a preconceived notion, and that's what you're going to get out of it. If you come to northern Minnesota in the wintertime and you think you're going to be cold, guess what? You will be cold. If you come to northern Minnesota in the wintertime and you want to snowmobile, you're going to be thrilled. It's a matter of perspective. Okay, that's maybe a crazy illustration. But um, Job is full of um, par par parallelisms and antithetical couplets, big words. But what it basically means is a parallel is something you're, you're um, analyzing side by side. So a wa wash me and I will be whiter than snow, cleanse me. So it's a comparison. And then the antithetical is something that is the opposite. So we have a wise son versus a foolish son. So you're gonna see that a lot in the book of Job. It is a book of poetry. Now it's not the poetry like Mary had a little lamb, and of course, there's many different versions to Mary Had a Little Lamb, like the one we learned. Mary had a little lamb, she tied him to a heater, and every time he turned around, he burned his little cedar. Okay, now, <clears throat> maybe not poetry. But we also grew up where we listened to the cremation of Sam McGee, okay? So there's, there's lots of different poetry. Um, sometimes poetry rhymes, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it has a pattern or a meter to it. So Job is narrative. It's a narrative history. It's something that actually happened. And its author is not known. Uh, some people uh, give it um, Moses, and Moses lived in Midian for many years, which would have been abutting the land which the land of Oz would, would have been, Northern Arabia. So that would have made sense that Moses would have heard the story and wrote it down, but there's many other options. Uh, we're, we're making the assumption based on um, commentaries that it was around Abraham, Isaac, Esau time period. Um, one of, the, one of the reasons why we do that is two things. Number one, it mentions sacrifice. And the other, it mentions Job's wealth um, in animals. And that's not something that, uh, that, is, that is anything past you get to Solomon. It's measured in gold. Now, if I was to measure my wealth in animals, I'm down to zero. Sold my horse. We have nothing else here. I have a dog. There's my value in my dog. And he, of course, thinks the world rotates around him. The other part is that Job would have made sacrifices for his family. So it was a, very much, he was the priest of the family, the patriarchal system. And uh, we don't see any of the other requirements that you would have learned later in Exodus that he would have adhered to. So it's interesting, though, because I think this is fascinating because Job is, is highly touted by God as um, being blameless and poor as evil. And he puts, allows Job to go through this whole interesting saga. And then Job doesn't even make it in Hebrews 11. Now I am selfish and self-focused enough to think that if I'm going to go through all that, at least get me on the wall of faith. But that wasn't the point. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is, is back in the day, the um, th uh, theory of divine retribution is basically s the people believed at that time point that if something ha was happening that was going wrong in your life, it was because of sin. It was something you had done wrong. And it's kind of like we talk about the cause and effect. Well, they had the effect before the cause. So um, Job's friends came and because he had the effects of something really going wrong, they assumed that the cause was because of that instead of the fact that God was allowing him to, to be tested. And it was really kind of a battle between Satan and God and Job was just in the middle. So um, Job's three friends were a Temanite, a Nathanite, and a Shuite. And then we have one up here at the end of the book. And um, we're gonna jump right in because there's a lot to talk about in the first couple of verses. So in the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless, upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 3, camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 700 
donkeys and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among the people of the East. Okay, now that's that's interesting because the first thing we, we learn about is that he was blameless and upright and he feared God and he shunned evil. So that is his character before God. And then it talks about his seven sons and daughters. Now, back in the day, if you had one son, amazing. You were blessed. Two sons, wow, three sons. So whether or not they were literally going by seven sons, he was abundantly blessed because he had sons and he had multiple sons. Now, I had one son, well, I had two sons, but God let me keep one son. He's in Tennessee. Uh, they made the assumption in that culture that the daughters would be going to live with their husbands and they would not be um, be counted, not counted, but they'd have their sons, their husbands' families. So, so he was blessed by having sons and, and daughters. He was blessed by having a family. And then it goes on to tell what his wealth assets were. And then at the very end, he was the greatest man among the people of the East. So we look at the three things. We see integrity and character before God. We see a reputation among people. And then sandwiched in the middle are the things that God allowed him to have while on this earth. And at the end of the chapter, he's going to talk about naked came I into this world, naked I will return. Um, and it's the bookmarks. We come into this world with nothing. We can't do anything for ourselves. And actually toward the end of our life, a lot of times that is the case also. We, we, we don't have um, our strength. We often are sick and other people have to take care of us. But in the meantime, between those bookmarks, God gives us a, an amazing amount of things to handle. Now, now, you might not have all the sons and all the daughters and all the donkeys and all the... You might not have that, but when you look at what you have, you're wealthy beyond understanding. So the message says, he was an honest man inside and out, a man of his word, who told, was totally devoted to God and evil with a passion. He wanted to keep God and evil totally separate so if we were going to reword the values that Job lived, how would we reword it? Um, some things that maybe come to my mind would be uh, his whole passion in his life was to honor God with his words and with his actions. And that I think um, is sometimes easy to say and, of course, obviously hard to do. And he was very, very wealthy. And we we have the New Testament, Jesus um giving the story about how hard it is for a rich man to go to heaven because he they often put the attention on the assets and the wealth, not on who gave them the assets and the wealth. And Job had identified right off the bat that there was a reason why he was wealthy and it was not Job. And then we have... Um, we have two parts of Job, and I think that's the one thing that sometimes we don't think about is we have the physical part of Job and we have the spiritual part of Job. So we have the two, I guess you can't see my hands on here. We have the two parts of Job, and how do they how do they rub shoulders with each other? How does the physical Job rub shoulders with the spiritual Job? Well, actually, the spiritual Job is the bookmarks. He was upright, blameless, feared God, shunned evil. And he had a great reputation among people. So that was his spiritual presence of who he was. And his physical presence was in the middle. Totally surrounded by his integrity and his reputation. We have a culture that really tr focuses more on what we look like, who we, what we own, um, instead of who we are. And so Job sets that up right off the bat, that his character and his reputation are the bookends to his life. And what God has given him to take care of is, 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 just, is just what God's given him. He didn't, he didn't have anything to do with it. It was a blessing from God. So it talks about that righteousness anticipates our humanity and Job didn't want any doubt about hidden sin. And that starts in verse four. His son used to hold, his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Now, this was Job's regular custom. This goes also 
with those bookends of his, his integrity and his reputation. And he really didn't want any, any doubts about hidden sin. He wanted his family pure. And that he took very seriously. I think in our culture, we live in a culture that just flaunts whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it. However we want to do it, doesn't matter who thinks anything. What a difference between the way Job lived. And then in verse 6 to 12, God allows Satan to test Job. And God says, yes, have you considered my servant? And Satan says, well, yeah, but but you've protected him. You've, you've got this big wall around him. And of course, he's going to praise you and everything goes well. So then verse 13 to 19 we have example of a really bad, horrible, mixed up day. There's a book, a kid's book, that's kind of got a title like that. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Now, we have bad days, and we think everything can go goes wrong that could go wrong, and no, it really hasn't. But Job did. Job had everything goes bad that could go bad, and it goes from bad to worse. And his reaction is to, naked I came, naked will I return, and he worshiped the Lord. Is worship our first reaction when things go wrong in life? Um, oftentimes it's not, but Job takes ownership of what is his and there's not much, it's all God's. And when we think about that, when we think about how Job put the bookends of his life, the priorities, how would we change our life if our priorities were the bookends, our character before God, our reputation before people, and in the middle, how we stewardship the things that God gives us. Not holding so tight to them that God has to pry our hands off them, but God gave Job everything he had. And then Job, God elected to take away from Job the things that God had given Job. We really clench tightly the things we call, we want that are ours. We hold them tight. We squeeze them, and when you do that, not only do we not balance our priorities, but we also have inordinate affection toward the things we think are ours. We should spend more time building our character and our integrity before God and making sure our reputation to other people honors God. And then what God gives us in the middle, take care of that too. So Job won a lot of things to think about. Um, are we worried more about our character, our possessions, or our reputation? Thanks.